So, uh, CGL says that more and less are um, adverbs sometimes, and um, I say they're not. Um, so, uh, oops, it's not really the way I expect that to work. Why is that? Huh. <laughs> okay, I guess I'm scrolling. I'm not sure why that's that. Um, so, uh, in 1784, this is a paper that um, Jeff turned up. Uh, um, John Hunter was writing about prepositions. And um, this paper was actually read at this university, probably in the library um, in the, uh, the Royal Society. Um, and he said that most people take prepositions and they split them out into prepositions and adverbs and conjunctions, and that's silly. They're just prepositions. And I'm making essentially a, a similar kind of argument. And um, he took this from physics. He says, is it they to do with more what can be done with fewer? In other words, let's not use more categories when, when we don't need them. And that's essentially my argument here with more and less. So to give you a bit of background, um, in case you're not uh, full of um, CGL stuff already, um, CGL makes a distinction between categories, lexical categories in this case, um, such as noun, adjective, determinative, which I'll call D, and um, functions, this is the functions in, in your sense, this is syntactic functions. Um, such as subject, head, determiner, etc. And determiner, I should have put it here, would be DDT. Um, so D is for the category, DDT is for the, the function. Um, oh, no, it's working. Oh, no, it's not. <laughs> um, all right. Now, one of the reasons that CGL does this is so that they can have these cross cutting. Uh, Works. So you, you have many-to-many -many relationships between um, categories and, and what they do. So for example, um, you can have the determinative functioning as a determiner or the determinative functioning as a modifier. Um, now this is a case where CGL says both of these are determinatives. Even though this is a modifier, it's not an adverb here, according to CGL and according to um, and then you have other things, uh, pronoun uh, being a determiner or an adverb being a modifier. So you've got this many-to-many -many relationship uh, between these um, words. So the issue then uh, comes down to, to this. Um, so all of these underlined words in blue here um, are determinatives. And these ones are adverbs, according to CGEL. Um, so you've got all these different functions in, in different um, phrase types, uh, but only these ones are, are categorized differently. And um, so what I'm saying is you don't need to do that. If you can do all of this, you can do that with these as well. And you ought to. Not only can you, but you ought to. Um, so what are these particular relationships? Um, well, CGEL says that for the comparative category, analytic marking is by means of the adverb more, not the determinative more, the adverb more, uh, which we will represent as more sub A. Um, and this analysis is extended to most, uh, less, and least, okay? And um, my, my arguments uh, apply to all of these as well, but it's just easier to focus on, um, on more. So I'll, I'll just focus mostly on that in, in what I talk about in, in the data. Um, so CGL says that analytic more does not enter into any degree modifier contrasts with much. Um, so we can say this is more porous than that, but we can't say this is much porous. So um, these two in analytic structures, um, 
I, I'm sorry. Yes, in analytic structures, these two don't contrast. Um, so the adverb categorization is then extended to less, even though the claim is really uh, just about more. They don't claim that less doesn't contrast. Um, and there are, there are some more obvious contrasts with less, um, but uh, they focus on, on more. So I said that's only in the analytic uh, construction. Um, so what is an analytic construction specifically for there? I'm, I'm sure everybody sort of knows in general, but um, the analytic construction, according to Matthews, is one in which separate words realize grammatical distinctions that in other languages or in other contexts of the same language may be realized by inflection. Um, so something like comparative like, uh, likelier is synthetic, while more likely is analytic. So these are the constructions we're, we're saying, or CGEL is saying, much and more cannot appear in uh, the same kind of situation. Um, but um, if you sort of dig through the data, um, it appears not to be true. And, and this is really the, the heart of my paper, and it's a very simple claim that um, you do get contrasts between more and much um, with comparative governors, uh, which is a term that I'll explain later, that's a CGEL term, um, which includes adjective phrases, uh, certain adjective phrases and prepositional phrases. But then also in other adjective phrases, you, you get um, contrasts, and in some prepositional phrases, you get contrasts. Um, so my claim then is that, you know, their, their, their factual claim about lack of contrast is not true and therefore there's no justification for uh, this separate analysis of more and less. Um, all right, so comparative governors. Uh, for CGL, a comparative governor is a lexeme that licenses complements expressing the secondary term in a comparison. So uh, the word different licenses uh, from or than, um, similar licenses to, um, uh, equal to, preferable to, um, uh, sim differently again than or, or from. Um, like uh, as a preposition, and these are all CGEL analysis, so CGEL is calling like a preposition. License is a direct object, and as license is a, a direct complement as well. So um, in these cases, we do get uh, this contrast. So the pair is more or much, uh, not much different. and. Um, uh, Philip earlier said um, exactly this phrase, it was more different. Uh, uh, I, I forget exactly what it was, it was the HD, HDID ones are more different. Um, and we get they're more or they're much like the other. And this one is particularly interesting um, because much is typically a non, uh, uh, an NPI. And here, it's, it's a positive context. There. And I, I really don't know why that is. Um, John suggested to me that I should be splitting these out, and I haven't split them out, uh, but it's, it's a good thought. So um, yeah, some of these, uh, many of these um, comparative governors are adjectives, but there are some other um, adjectives that are uh, not comparative governors that also show this contrast. Um, so the past participial adjectives, not every particip participial adjective, but a certain selection of them, fairly small selection of them, um, and all of these are attested in, in uh, COCA, um, seem to allow this much more uh, contrast. And then 
the A adjectives, again, not all of them, um, but some of them, seem to allow uh, this contrast. So they don't seem much inclined to leave, or uh, they don't seem more inclined to leave. Either one is possible. Um, so, up in the comparative governors, I showed you that differently uh, is a comparative governor and, and it licenses this. Um, and, and that's it, as far as I can tell, for adverbs. But when I was looking through the adverbs, one thing that I noticed um, was two. And two is very odd because um, usually when we have a bare adverb or a bare adjective, uh, more goes with that and it makes it comparative, right? Um, and we don't get much with the two form, typically. That's essentially CGL's whole claim. But when it comes to two, this is flipped. So you can't get more with, you can't say that's more too special, um, but you can get much. So that's much too spicy but that not that's more too spicy. So that, that was uh, an interesting piece of data that I, you know, wouldn't have occurred to me without sort of looking through the, the corpus as sort of as Philip and Peter were saying earlier. Um, so it's not a contrast. Um, you could say it's sort of a more general, uh, if you're looking at the cases of adverb phrases, it is a contrast within adverb phrases, but it's not a contrast specifically of one two. Um, but it, it is kind of interesting, and I'll come back to it later. Um, so, oh, this goes to Steve. Um, also in preposition phrases. Now, um, as far as I can tell, CJ was not explicit about this. Uh, maybe I've just overlooked it. But as far as I can tell, in preposition phrases, it seems to say that more or less are determinatives. Um, but CGL analyzes near, close, and far as prepositions. And these are prepositions that have comparative forms. So you have near, nearer, right? nearest, close, closer, etc. Um, so if we go back to Matthew's definition of what an analytic comparative is, these are analytic comparatives. So within prepositional phrases then, we do have analytic and um, synthetic distinctions. And so then, um, if we look at a case like this, age is much on my mind or age is more on my mind these days. And again, this is a, not a negative context for much interesting. Um, so we, we can see that there is there is this contrast here. Um, so those are three cases uh, in which um, I would say CGL very uncharacteristically has um, aired. Um, the, the comparative governors, the uh, past participial and the A adjectives, and the PPs with the analytic comparison. Um, and then, uh, um, and then sort of if you look at PPs more generally, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, if you look at adverbs more generally, but not, not really. So basically that's, that's the claim is that it's just factually wrong. It's unmotivated and, uh, and that's that. Um, but that's only 14 minutes, so. <laughs> um, so, if we look just in general at modifiers, what we find is that, that there seems to be a very broad, there doesn't seem to be a pattern here, all right? Um, so if we've got a plain uh, adjective like big, which takes a synthetic comparative, um, less can work here and enough and that. So you can, you know, it's about that big, uh, it's big enough, um, it's less big, all of those work. 
but these other ones are, are not possible here. Um, with recent, which takes uh, an analytic form, so you would say more recent, more is possible and less is possible, but these other ones aren't. Um, with bigger, these ones are possible, but those aren't. But now we're pulling in this, um, and then that disappears later. So there's, there's just a lot of uh, variety here. And it seems to me that given this range of uh, variation, we should not expect that uh, a, a difference like this versus this is going to be enough to motivate uh, a category uh, assignment, a different category assignment, as opposed to, you know, this versus uh, this or, or something else. Um, we see the same thing in prepositional phrases. Um, slightly, slightly different, but um, again, you know, I won't go through all of them, but you can see that there's sort of a, it, it's hard to pick out a pattern and say, well, these group together, and so they should be adverbs, and these group together, and so they should be determinatives. There's no obvious pattern there. Um, so, um, I, another summary here, uh, but I'm only at 16 minutes, so I'll go on. Um, but um, just regardless of the category of the modifier, there is great variation in what modifiers can appear with which adverb, uh, adjective phrases and adverb phrases and prepositional phrases. Um, so even profound differences between more and much should, should be expected. That, that's, even if they're the same category, we should expect that. Um, and it shouldn't be the motivation. And I think that, unless I've misunderstood them, Payne, Huddleston, and Fulham in 2010 essentially make this same kind of claim. Um, they were arguing against Hans uh, Degrip. Um, and he was saying that adjectives and adverbs are just the same. It's one category. And he was doing this on distributional grounds, and they were saying no. So it's slightly different. Um, I'm, I'm looking at particular items. They were looking at whole categories and trying to say, no, we shouldn't collapse those. Um, but I, I think it's a similar kind of argument. I hope I haven't misunderstood that. So I, I've shown you that there are contrasts, but I mean, the contrasts are admittedly rare. We, we don't see them all over the place. There's a few selected items. And um, I've shown you that sort of there's this strange uh, pattern of modifiers working with some things and not other things. So I feel like I owe you some kind of explanation. And um, the explanation, what, whether you buy the explanation or not, really shouldn't matter for the, the main point. The main point, I think I've proven that you know, there are the contrasts, and so the distinction is not one But let me try an explanation. So Kennedy and McNally um, say that the scale structure of adjective phrases and adverb phrases really impacts a lot of things, and modification is one of them. Um, so when we're talking about scale structures here, um, we can go back to Stevens' 1946 uh, idea, and this is may be familiar to you from psychology or from statistics. Um, we have nominal scales, ordinal scales, interval scales, and ratio scales. Um, so this, uh, Kennedy and McNally says, can be applied to adjectives uh, as well. Um, and this isn't necessarily the categorization that uh, Kennedy and McNally would, I'm, I'm not claiming that they would sanction this, uh, but this is sort of how I came to it. So you've got these nominal uh, adjectives like equal, mutual, opposite, other, and twelve. Um, there's, no, there's no ordering to that. It's just a, it's a thing. The twelfth one is here. Um, now, I put twelfth in there because that's an ordinal adjective, obviously. 
but it's not on an ordinal scale. You cannot be more 12 or less 12, right? It, it, it is simply the 12. Um, and these don't take any kind of uh, modification uh, because they're just sort of that thing, right? Um, and then we can put the ordinal ones in there and they allow uh, ordinal kinds of modifiers. Um, then we can get the interval ones in there. Now, the interval scales here should uh, have, you know, like a one, a two, a three, a four. Um, and you would expect these, to, I, when I did this, I thought I'd have a check mark there, a check mark there, and a check mark there, and none here. And I have no explanation for why it's not like that. Um, but it isn't. And um, anyhow, uh, the, and then you get down to the ratio where you've got all of these, right? So you can have one fifth as high, and you can do the math on it uh, because it's a true ratio. So again, the scale structure does seem to be interacting quite a bit with the particular um, possibility for uh, modification, even if necessar not necessarily in the way uh, you might expect. Um, another way that this works is with the the structure, whether you have an open or, or closed, uh, and whether that's open or closed at the top or bottom. So um, if something is even slightly wet, it is wet. You, you can't go down to that uh, bottom end, but it can be as open as possible at the top. Um, on the other hand, something has to be completely straight to be straight. It can't be... Um, slightly straight, right? So you have these differences depending on whether uh, the scale is open or closed. Um, again, impacting the types of uh, modifiers that are possible. Now, when it comes to much, um, I've been inspired by Zhang and Ling, um, but I'm not sure that they would totally agree with what I'm saying here, so don't blame them for, for this. Um, but it seems to me that much requires some sort of uh, mid-scale, uh, so it can't be like the zero, uh, a mid-scale value as a point of reference, a, a kind of anchor. Um, and I, I'm not a semanticist, I hope you know, I, I know some of you are, so you can probably correct me on that. Um, and what I'm saying is that one of the things that Moore or ER does is it establishes that point by giving us this than complement, which is optional. Um, it may be there or it may not, uh, but that really doesn't matter. The point is whatever the oblique from that than PP is, gives us that mid-scale value, okay? Um, so if somebody is much older than Jeff, then Jeff's height, I'm sorry, Jeff's age gives us that value and then we can compare to that, okay? Um, the reason that past participial adjectives, not all of them, but some of them, uh, work is because they also uh, license a complement of some kind. Uh, so you can say much improved from a year ago. And so that value of a year ago then gives you that point uh, from which you can compare. Um, two does this as well. Um, if, if something is too big to fit, then uh, it's not a prepositional phrase, uh, it's uh, a two infinitable, but um, th this fitting ability gives you that point. So I've tried to, that, that's kind of hard to understand, so I've tried to show it graphically here. Um, so if you say it happened much more recently than yesterday, then yesterday gives us this point, recently gives us the scale, so it's a time scale, um, and then 
we've got it, it happened, okay? And then what much is doing is it's just saying what much does in a noun phrase. It says there's this quantity, it's a lot, okay? Um, so as long as you've got this anchor down here and uh, this up here, and this is licensed by the more, then you can just do your much the way you would do it in a noun phrase, something like that. Um, now, if we don't have more, if we have something else like very, very doesn't give you that. And so if you say it happened much very recently, it's nonsense um, because you don't have this anchor down here. So the, the quantity is undefined. The muchness is undefined of the reasons. Um, I'll give you another example here. Um, if we say something is much too big to fit, um, then the size, so the bigness tells us we've got a size scale, right? Um, the to fit gives you whatever size fits, that's our anchor. Uh, it is much too big to fit, and so we've got that large amount of size working in there, okay? Um, now, if we try to put two in there, um, with an ER, then we get a clash because we've got these two different anchor points um, with two different preposition phrases. And so you've got these two anchor points and, and we don't know what to do with that. So that's why that doesn't work there. Um, with improved, um, similar kind of story here. Uh, much improved from a year ago, a year ago gives us the anchor, the same story. Um, now injured doesn't work that way. You can't say they are much injured. Uh, injured doesn't license any kind of compliment. Um, so again, we've got this sort of undefined muchness down here. Um, lastly, different. Different is really interesting um, because when you say something is different, you haven't told us what kind of scale we have. We don't know if it's a size scale, it could be a color scale. It's different in some way, but it's unspecified, right? Um, and, and then we've just got this much difference on there. Now, why can we say A is much more different? We can put them both in there, or we can just put more, or we can just put much. Um, because when we put more in there, we've got a different, this is a difference of difference. So this is a difference scale, okay? So we've got a squared value happening here. Is that, is that clear? Yeah. Um, so now we've got a different scale. Here we had an unspecified scale. Here we had a different scale. And so on that different scale, we can then say, uh, AC is less than AB, wherever AB, we don't know where it is, but um, it's less, okay? So, um, as I said, I can't account for all of the data like this. Um, there are past participial adjectives like inclined that do seem to work with both much and more, and yet don't license any kind of compliment. So I don't have a story for that. Um, and I don't really have a story for the A adjectives either. But, coming back to what I've said uh, two or three times, um, I, I think I've clearly shown that the original claim was wrong, that there are differences here. Um, even if there weren't differences, I don't think the argument would really hold because we, that's sort of what we would expect. Um, and why would this be? Well, I think scales help us uh, understand why it would be, maybe not entirely, but uh, mostly. So, thanks to all of these people. Thank you. All right. Oh, oh. Well, let me say first that the detailed scene was complex, but quite convincing, interesting. You may well be right. And uh, one of the things this 
provokes me to think about is that uh, after all these hundreds of years of studying English grammar, we still can't do the basic lexical categorization in a way that is beyond dispute. All dictionaries are wrong about most prepositions. And you tied this stuff about uh, categorization to that sort of uh, difference. So there's many, many things to think about here. Uh, okay. Thank you for that. I'm still thinking about them. This isn't a question. I, I was going to say, you owe me a question. It's got to be an interrogative in here somewhere. Um, Perhaps it was a, uh, an interrogative um, content clause instead. I, I got an interrogative. What, what is it, term, if there's one person I can think, out, think about of who would do this much better than me, it's John Payne. What does John Payne think of this? <laughs> <laughs> well, John disagrees. Uh, John and I have been emailing back and forth about this. Uh, actually, John said he's agnostic. Yeah, I'm, I'm agnostic at the moment uh, because, first of all, I think there's probably two separate things. One is whether much contrasts with more, and that seems to be very limited, especially in the case where you have the negative uh, polarity item much, which is what you have in the determinative. Mm -hmm. And that's not what you always get with these things like she is much improved. Um, so is this a different much? That's the first kind of question. The second question is, OK, I think probably I'm speaking for Rodney here, because I was there when this was actually announced to me. Uh, he was writing the comparatives chapter, and he said, I think better take more and less in comparatives as adverbs, not determinatives, because of the reason that you gave. Now, uh, I went along with that because it seemed basically right, even if there are exceptions to it. So my question would be, are you throwing the baby out with the bathwater here? There are a limited number of exceptions seem to have to do with special meanings of much. And I wonder whether that justifies throwing out the general difference between the muches and the mores, sorry, between the mores, the more in the comparatives, yeah. and the uh, more else yeah. there. Those I wonder if, if, you're, if you're going to do that, right, and you're going to say, well, with most of these uh, analytic constructions, um, then it's not so much on the necessarily the analytic constructions. It's just sort of, you know, we've we've got this difference in in distribution, and enough goes along with less. It, it patterns exactly the same as far as I can tell. So, are you going to put enough on that side and and say, well, enough is also an adverb? because it patterns with less and, and not with, like why, why, why much and more? Why those two? Okay, so what's the comparison between much and less? So, um, uh, basically anywhere where you can get less, you can get post head enough. So, it's near enough, um, and it's uh, uh, less near. Um, but you can't get, it's nearer enough. Can you? That's, yeah? Okay, so that, that should be a check mark there. Um, but, but again, less and more aren't entirely perfect. And then up to date enough or less up to date, uh, short of the mark enough, less up. Uh, so generally enough patterns pretty much with less. If you're saying most of the time, should enough also be an adverb? I wonder actually what less, what, what Rodney would have done with these prepositional phrase cases mm. 
that you have because they don't, apart from the three that you mentioned near close and far. Part of it. Yeah. Apart from those three, none of them enter into the synthetic right. analytic uh, distinction. Yes. Um, I don't know. I can't speak for Rodney here, but I think that was probably his key comparison. There is, if you like, a, a kind of paradigm here in which you have synthetic versus analytic. And it was only in that particular paradigm that you would have this difference more. Yeah. What, what I would say, though, is that and this is why I'm agnostic. And that is, even if there is a different more there, then this still doesn't mean that it's necessarily an average. Uh, you were saying a different much. Yeah. Right? So, so if you have yeah. more as different from much. Yes when it's in this paradigm of analytic versus synthetic yes. comparative, then there's still an argument about what category it should be. Yes. And you could have it as distinct, just another different kind of more. Right, it's the more category. Yeah, so that, that is where I'm agnostic. I'm not sure what the category should be. Yes. I sort of buy the idea that it's the analytic synthetic paradigm which right. is what motivated Rodney primarily. Yeah. And I mean that you know that's the traditional analysis obviously and um, I think CGEL has pushed back against the traditional analyses in so many ways I'm surprised that it didn't push back here. Yes? I was just going to say I, mean, I think it, the suggestions at the end are make a lot of sense to me as a semanticist who's worked on degree stuff. Oh that's nice to hear. And, and in particular, it's, you know, I mean, so I, I think it's good to focus on the Kennedy and McNally intervention because, um, you know, the distribution of modifiers in English is largely chaos. And, you know, they were able to impose some order on that, but there's also a lot of stuff that just appears to be just lexically being determined. Like, you know, that you much alike makes sense, but much happy doesn't. And, and I, I don't detect any general pattern in a lot of these cases, but there are patterns. And the, the one you identified with much, the, the, the suggestion you put to me was very, very similar to the way that people analyze slightly mm -hmm. in terms of like that the distribution of that is really determined by whether there's a sufficiently precise anchor point available, either compositionally or kind of in the discourse context. Um, and it, it strikes me that almost all of the examples you gave with much, you could substitute slightly there in the mm -hmm. problem. Mm -hmm. um, but there's one exception, which is injured. Mm -hmm. So I can be slightly injured, but now we're in the user WH. Why can't I be much injured if I can be slightly injured? Okay. So yeah, that's, yeah. That, that's I think the cool puzzle. Th thank you for the question, and I don't have an answer. Because you know, it makes, like I, you were saying, like, I yeah. think it makes sense given the meaning of injured, because there's a point of being completely healthy, having yes. no injuries. That's why you can say someone's slightly injured. Mm -hmm. But the, if that's right, then I think you should be able to say they're much injured on this kind of semantic analysis. And yet you don't seem to be able to. Yeah. Perhaps we'll get. I have two quick follow up on that. So, uh, another question related to this point. So, I'm wondering how exactly, like, to what extent you are endorsing uh, Kennedy's um, analysis? Do you think that 2005 is a semantic thesis? They also discuss the inclusion of much. And it seems like it's, it's pretty, let's say, mild to a certain extent here. So, I, so, first of all, could you clarify like, to what extent your, your proposal is different or whether it is actually different? And then in, for Madame's um, particular example, I think they also mentioned that this difference between much and and well and badly. So there are something idiosyncratic about them. So, okay. so in the case of Inger, I think um, because it's a magnitude category, so I think you would say badly in Inger. Right. But but basically for them, I think the the necessity condition is the same. So they want there to be a um, minimum. Yeah. 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 So I, I was very excited when I found um, Kennedy and McNally. I, I didn't know about them, and, and I, as I said, not a semanticist. I really know very little about it. Um, and so I really wanted their analysis of much to just sort of, you know, fit onto my data, and I couldn't make it fit. Um, so uh, to the extent that I understand it, um, I would have to say that my analysis is different. Um, do I uh, 
you know, do I agree with their basic point? Again, to the extent that I understand it, the idea that scales matter seems to make sense, but it's a very naive um, understanding. Okay, thank you very much.